Welcome to Event Icons, where you get to chat with the icons of the event industry. I'm Brent Kruger, and today we are going to be talking about meetings mean business. Now, we all know that uh, we don't plan events in a vacuum. Uh, we plan them for people in deep regulatory environments and with constantly changing rules that are moving all over the place. And in order to move our industry forward, we need to have a voice with our regulators and policymakers, ultimately in every country. Meetings Mean Business has taken many steps in this direction. And today you'll hear from these strategic thinkers and learn what you can do. Today we're being joined by Michael Owen and Heidi Welker. That's coming up right now on this episode of Event Icons. It's Wednesday at 5 p.m. Eastern, so you know what that means. It's time for another episode of Hashtag Event Icons. Presented by Endless Events. The show where you get to ask the icons of the events industry anything. Use the question panel on the webinar to submit your questions. Or you can hop on Twitter. Submit your questions with Hashtag Event Icons. We'll be answering your questions live during the entire show. Before we get started, the more people we have watching, the better conversation we can have. So please help share hashtag event icons on Twitter and Facebook. Just tell your friends to watch at www.event-icons.com. Now, without any further delay, this is hashtag event icons. I'm so thrilled to have our guests here today. Meetings mean business. This is a huge step forward. So we're going to tell you a little bit about the illustrious thought thinkers that are coming in. We have Michael Owen, who has decades of experience as a provider of corporate entertainment and event management services. Michael shares a wealth of knowledge gained through his career in the business events industry. He's a frequent presenter at industry conferences and learning institutions, speaking on what's now and what's next in meeting and events. And he shared earlier with us today that if you catch him at an open bar, he will say yes to your next committee billing. So just invite him on in. He's going to come for help. Heidi, who is joining us today from Panama, is a people-oriented and results-driven professional with more than 35 years of experience in meetings and events industry. She has experience in driving organizational growth through various integrated marketing and lead generation activities with an extensive background in operations, sales, business development, and industry partnerships. A longstanding and active member of the Industry Association Meetings Professional International and PCMA, Professional Convention Management Association. Say that five times fast. She's dedicated <laughs> to giving back to the community. So we are thrilled to have both of you here today to talk a little bit about what this looks like from a meetings means business. But before we get into that, Let's talk a little bit about you. Heidi, you want to start us off and tell us a little bit about what got you into the events industry? And if you weren't doing events, what would you be doing? Well, heavens, that's so long ago. I guess I started back in the industry in the 1980s with um, an organization called Livingston. And I was actually a customs broker. And through some various sales and operations opportunities, I then moved into the marketing services side. And as part of that, um, goods coming into Canada, especially from a trade show perspective, had to be cleared through customs. And that's what I did. And then, I guess back in 1980, 19, the early 1980s, the Metrotronic Convention Center opened. And the president and CEO at that time knew who I was and also knew that um, an audiovisual company at the time called Telab um, was looking for a director of marketing. So that's how I really got into the full fledge. And I don't know what I'd do if I wasn't in the business because I just love it. It's all about networking. It's about people. It's about face-to-face -face interaction. It's about digital interaction that we're experiencing right now. It's just about people coming together for a good cause and wanting to do a community-driven initiative, whether that's business events or a philanthropy a philanthropic uh, opportunity. So I'm so glad I'm part of this business. How about you, Michael? Uh, I got into the business through the path of least resistance. <laughs> I, I, I started out many years ago, leaving college and playing music, which brought me into the entertainment business. I got into the business of entertainment as an agency and manager, which I did for many, many years, which led me into corporate entertainment. Oh probably 25 years ago. Um, also to various other things such as event management and ad advice on production. I don't do production. I have good people like Brant and Will and 
you know, call the people in that, that know what they're doing. Um, uh, like most of us in this industry, you know, you didn't start out growing up thinking that you were you going to be uh, in two meetings and events. You grow up thinking you're going to be a fireman or an astronaut or a, a worthless hippie in my case. Uh, and uh, it, it just led to one thing and another. And I would echo what Heidi says. And I've got stories out the wazoo of folks who have left the industry for one reason or another and couldn't wait to get back in it because of the dynamic people that you work with. Uh, we were talking earlier on the lead up about the feeling of accomplishment and, and just being fed by seeing other people do well. I started on stage and I've spent most of my life watching from the wings. Uh, and it's the same thing with the events. I'm not involved with the events, but I'm involved in making them happen. And, and it's spectacular. Uh, and the, the, the quality of people, the creativity that, that you come across, um, every now and then we'll get a stinker and have to fire them, but that's a whole nother podcast. So, and that's it. Yeah. Well, with that in mind, thinking about all that experience, what is meetings mean business? What got you guys involved? What was kind of the impetus for? Um, it, you know, here in the U S I tell you, it, it, the, this goes back to as far as nine 11. Okay. So when nine 11 hit, of course, that was a crisis. It stunned all of us. We had a huge downturn in the industry, uh, and the industry reacted. Instead of being having an active group of industry uh, leaders and associations working together to have a unified message, uh, we had a variety of messages, and they came together. And then as things sort of settled and evened out, then that sort of went away. And then in 2008, we had the financial crisis. Uh, from the financial crisis, uh, and Heidi, if I'm, I'm incorrect, please correct me, but the, that was the genesis of meetings mean business. That's when uh, folks came together and said, listen, we have to talk outside the room. We, we, we can no longer wait until we're under attack or until we, we have a devastating financial situation or, or uh, economic situation. Uh, we must be able to um, let people know what we're about, the economic impact of what we do. Uh, the Global Meetings Industry Day portion was actually inspired by National Meetings Industry Day in, in uh, Canada. Uh, and it, that, that's one of the most visible things that uh, Meetings Mean Business does, but that's, that's my take on it. I'm, I'm curious, was there any, as part of that push you said around the financial, um, uh, the, finan the financial issues that were going on, was some of that push that came back a pushback against some of the regulations and things where we saw crackdowns against large financial companies and, you know, some of the scandals that were around bagels and how much things cost and $90 pots of coffee. I mean, was there, was that part of the reason of trying to get a voice in the room? Oh, Absolutely. You know, it came out, and uh, what was happening is all of a sudden, what we what we know as legitimate business uh, travel was painted as uh, junkets and fun. And oh my gosh, they brought their golf clubs. Well, you know, the AIG effect, right? And the AIG meeting that hit all the headlines at multi hundreds of thousands of dollars in cost, and this was throwing away money. Actually. I, I'm familiar with the folks who put that on and because it was sponsored and because these were individuals who paid their own way to go is why they got to bring their golf clubs. Um, it, it, it got blown way out of a por proportion. And, you know, if you look at something in isolation and you're not in this business and you look at the supposed cost of a muffin, it's not really what the cost of a muffin is and how much is, a, is coffee. Well, my gosh, we don't want to pay that much for coffee, but somebody's got to brew it, move it, change it, one thing and another. And that's, that, that gets down into the weeds sort of, of of explaining what we do. But if we're not talking outside the room, if we're, not talk, if we're only talking to each other, uh, we're not moving the needle. 
I was able to, um, I don't want to dominate the conversation because I know Heidi's very involved in this, but I, I was involved with the, a push to get the, that beautiful convention center built in Nashville a few years ago. And in Nashville, I don't know how it is everywhere else, but we have what I call cavemen, which are councilmen against virtually everything. Doesn't make any difference. And what that part of the story of meetings being business is telling the story of the economic impact. In our instance, building that, no, we don't want to pay those taxes, but you're not paying those taxes. And the reason is that people coming into the city are paying that, those taxes. And that's part of the reason why your taxes are not going up substantially. Um, that's a difficult story to tell when you're reacting to an uncomfortable situation. It's something that should be talked about all the time. Well, Heidi, maybe that's a good idea to kind of think about. I mean, tell us exactly what it is, the economic impact and how through this and movement, you're helping get the message of it, especially with your background in marketing. Has that been a, a big piece of your contribution? It has. And I just want to go back uh, to a couple of things that Michael said. He spoke about what happened in the U.S. Our situation in Canada was a little bit different in that we had a SARS epidemic. Mm. And SARS hit, um, we lost a lot of business, a lot of large cancer research is a very good example, but there were a lot of businesses that are a lot of uh, associations that canceled their meetings in Canada. And that was devastating not just for those like in the audiovisual and expo business per se, but for convention centers, for the hotels and all of that. So an, an organization was formed back in the early 90s called BEICC, which, which was called the Business Events Industry Council. Unfortunately, it just never got the roots it needed to grow. And so when Meetings Mean Business in the U.S. was formed, we took a look at that saying, you know what? We can't afford for another devastation or another threat like this. We need an organization that where we can be a very proactive force, understand what's going on at all levels of government so that if we have an ear close to the ground and we can get wind in advance of whether there's tax increases or some sort of threat that we can react to it in a very positive professional manner. So we took on the license for meetings being business in Canada and, and we really see it as the single advocacy voice for the business events industry in our country with a key focus to communicate the importance of business events to stakeholders across the country in order to promote investment and to ensure that it continues to prosper. Your comment, Michael, about the uh, Nashville Convention Center, that holds very true with a lot of our convention centers across Canada with respect to expansion, because there's been a lot of um, uh, negativity about expanding because the communities around those convention centers don't understand it. They don't see the social and economic value. And so that's what makes it more and more difficult for uh, convention centers to go to their city councillors and go to the provincial and in our case federal government and say we need an expansion these are the numbers this is what we see well the stick constituencies in those areas their MPs don't see the value because nobody talks about it so from a business uh, means business in Canada per Canada perspective we really need to start communicating and talking about what how we help drive community and social initiatives for a positive gain for all of us. I couldn't agree more. What, um, what portions of our industry do you, do you feel like this affects the most? Is it mainly business sectors? Is it, uh, you know, kind of everywhere? I mean, like you mentioned, it, it seems to me there's a lot of trickle down in a lot of this stuff, you know, whether it's the, you know, like there's the convention center level and then there's the AV and then there's the catering and all this kind of stuff. But, you know, are there any uh, sectors that are more affected than, than others? Well, uh, just speaking from, again, going back to my experience working with the national CBB on, on uh, advocacy to get that building built, we, it took us 10 years. Um, because we had not been talking about these things, and that's part of the problem, part of the purpose of, of meetings mean business and global meetings industry day is to, to have this have this information out in the ether uh, all the time. So we're not starting from behind zero. That's how I described our efforts. And I can recall that 
the our cavemen, our councilmen, they would say, well, you know, this is the, the fat cats getting rich because what would happen is when they'd have an event, uh, they would bring in the uh, the owners of the hotel or the general managers and what have you, all clearly have who should have a voice in this. What they weren't seeing is how how the, it affected people within the industry, just as you described. And so there was a rally and I said, here's what we're going to do. We're going to have housekeeping. We're going to have doorman we're going to have my musicians with their guitars on their backs we're going to have our staff with cut so we we brought in about 60 people in there we asked them to show up in their uni uniforms with their name tag to to demonstrate the immediate impact to those individuals then the challenge becomes explaining that this is an investment I mean, I know that, that we get into semantics, but it's an investment. It's not a cost. It's an investment that's going to pay off, and it, it's in taxes. Here's what we expect in taxes. If, if you, there was, there's one fella, and I won't mention his name, but there's one fella who is anti any development in convention centers. He's with the Brookings Institute, and, and they brought him in to, to talk about uh, – you can find examples of where money has been spent foolishly, uh, on these projects and that. Uh, but what he wanted to, to talk about, he was saying in Nashville, you know, this will never work because my statistics show that it does not spur investment. If you were in Nashville six years ago and you came to Nashville today, you wouldn't recognize it. There's an entire area of town, not just hotels, but businesses of all kinds who have popped up because the convention center has been built. Hotels, there are 4,000 4, or 5,000 rooms coming online in Nashville, but it's not just those. It's other business support. I mean, we being in this business understand that, that we have, we have stagehands. I have bus ladies, you know, help us load the buses. We have, so, so that's the immediate impact, but the residual impact is in the taxes that, that come in and keep uh, local taxes low. I want to get into that because I mean, so you talked about the numbers and the investment and uh, the amount of money that's involved up and down the chain. Um, you know, when, when I tell people I'm in the meetings and events industry and I get, first I get the blank look, but after that I tell people it's the, you know, it's the, it's the, one of the biggest little industries that nobody's ever heard of, right? It, where it's billions and billions of dollars. So I was wondering if you guys could go into a little bit about those numbers and, you know, uh, the, the numbers behind meetings and how much they contribute to the economies. So I'll speak to that um, in that we were just part of this global industry study. So Canada ranks five out of 60 in terms of um, business events. And we globally spend, or sorry, we, our, our impact represents $33 billion, 229,000 jobs and 19.3 billion of direct spend. But I think what's really important here, and it speaks to something Michael was talking about um, in terms of, you know, the people that this affects, just think of the restaurant, uh, the restaurant communities, right? If there's a major disaster in the city, these small restaurants go out of business. One of the reasons that meetings mean business in Canada was so important because we have a lot of very small businesses that would, are truly affected by a disaster or by a threat or by a non-expansion, that type of thing. But listen, at the end of the day, we've been told that the business traveler contributes four times the spend than that of a leisure travel from an economic impact perspective. That's huge. So that speaks volumes for the opportunity in Canada. One could also argue um, that business events drives tourism instead of tourism driving business events. And I'm not going to go there because I can't validate that information. Though but Austin and South by could for you if you've been down south at any rate. I was just there. I was just there last yeah. weekend. I just came from there. But, you know, the reality is as a business traveler, you do spend more money. You tend to be there a little bit longer. And you know what? If you like where you are, you're going to bring your family back to experience it. So there's a lot of um, value in business events, but just to end this point, we do such a great job of talking to ourselves mm. about it, but we do such a poor job and it opens so much opportunity that we start speaking to the communities at large and have them truly understand what meetings 
and business events are all about. Amen. Well, thinking about that, where do you see it going? You see the industry continuing to grow. You know, is this a place where as we're thinking about that, are we going to continue to grow? How are we supposed to be having those conversations that help us grow? Well, you know, I, I think that we're subject for to effects of the operating environment, the economy, politics, there are a variety of issues that affect us that we have no control over. All we can do is control what we had. Right. If we do a better job of telling our story outside the room, uh, then it, it, it makes it easier to, to get things done when we need things done. I, I would argue, and I, my friend Roger Rickard, I, don't, I know Roger was tied up today and couldn't be with us, but Roger is, is, is the advocacy guy for the meetings industry. He's the go-to advocacy guy for the meetings industry. And I talk to Roger all the time because he's very good about, he, here's what the impact is when you contact your uh, government uh, representatives. And that goes across the globe. That's not just in the U.S., that's everywhere. And, and what I, I will tell him is that I believe that advocacy also has to do with affecting the people around you, even down to your family, your family, your local uh, politicians, and, and the people at large. Because in, in the current political climate, at least in the United States, uh, we're so tribal that if, if one person says that it's good, the other person immediately knee jerks and says, this is terrible, we're gonna do it. And so you have to have the hard data. And you know the, the uh, Events Industry Council, I was a, a, a part of their APEX group for several years, but they released a study uh, that I just pulled up quickly and should have had before we started um, of uh, the impact the last year I just released it was last year they released it the, the economic impact of the, of the global industry and I if, if you got a minute I can read you some of the uh, absolutely pieces. bring it uh, the number of participants business events evolve more than 1.5 billion with a B across more than 180 countries in the globe direct spending these are business sales business events generated more than 1.07 trillion with wow. a of direct spending representing spending to plan and produce business events business related travel other direct spending that doesn't include the meal at peg leg porker in nashville <laughs> right it doesn't include those things it doesn't include st Lawrence's market in toronto you know the, the things that people do now we all know that we go to conferences and when you attend a conference you're there for the conference and you're pretty tied up but you have a little bit of time to see what's around you. The, the direct GDP uh, business events supported 10.3 million direct jobs globally and generated six, 621.4 billion of direct GDP. That's nothing to sneeze about. That's bigger than the auto industry. Yeah. It's huge. Um, average, the, uh, Heidi brought up spending for. Uh, per individual, average business spending per participant, on average, $704 spent per each event participant. If you look at the tourist numbers, which I've seen when I was in Nashville, I've seen they don't approach that per person. Uh, the top 50 countries accounted for $1.3 trillion uh, of, uh, in U.S. dollars of business events direct spending. So, now you have data. We never had the information. You know, I'll talk to, uh, what is the business case? The clients that, you know, you, it, it, I don't know about you, Brett, but my clients, one of, the, one of the reasons why they come to us is because we're good at separating wants from needs. It's hard to argue about what is a want versus a need if you don't have the data. Finally, we have the data, and, and that's a, a result of, uh, now this is Events Industry Council, but this is all with support of all of those who are involved in meetings mean business. So uh, having this information is, is extraordinarily important, I think. 
And Michael, I want to make sure we get that link from you. So if you could at some point drop it in the chat or something like that, then we can, we can push that out to uh, everybody else on the show um, and uh, get that information. Fast, I mean, fascinating numbers, amazing numbers. And then uh, I know Meetings Mean Biz uh, produces those kinds of numbers a lot as well as part of their promotional materials. And um, it's, uh, I want to say it was something like a 160% increase on every dollar uh, that, that gets spent uh, is what it, by the time it works its way through the system. So yeah, incredible amounts of numbers uh, from, from our, our little, our little known industry in the, in the corner. The biggest industry. And here, and here's, the, here's the challenge though, is that those numbers are great. We have, I mean, I shared with you some of our numbers in Canada, the numbers are great, but the average person doesn't understand it. It's too overwhelming for that. One of the things that we're doing in Canada as part of Meetings Being Business is we've just completed a storyboard and we've developed a communication plan that really speaks to those individuals so that when people see these videos or when we share these videos, this is your average person. And we're not really talking numbers like we can talk about at a high level because you know what? The, the retailer, the people working in retail, the ta they don't understand it. It's, it. We're too high level for them. It's great for us from a government perspective, but for, we, for us to have those communities talk to their MP, in our case, it has to be more roots level for them. And I think that's also part of our job in the meetings and business events industry and as part of the meetings being business that we have to, a multiple touch point strategy that we have to reach all these different components. The other thing uh, that I wanted to share uh, from a Canadian perspective is that we've now, we're now reaching out to all the different economic development um, communities across Canada because we know that they understand they're trying to bring new business into the country, uh, new headquarters for uh, corporations, that kind of thing. In order for that to all happen, they have to meet and often they meet quite frequently to make that happen. And we're trying to say, you know what, Canada is really strong, whether it's the ICT sector, health service sciences, whatever it is, you know, we're gonna, we want those organizations to come into Canada and meet um, because of the economic value, forget, you know, the economic impact of that one or whatever number of meetings those are is one thing, but the economic development that that can create by having those businesses come into Canada, open up an office and generate um, employment and a new expertise and, and I think we need to start talking about that as we speak about meetings being business. And I wanted to take a quick second for anyone who's watching us on the live stream or checking in, don't forget, we have a chat. So if you have questions for Heidi and Michael and you wanna bring, bring their brains to your power to maybe see what that storyboard looks like from Heidi or share your own story, drop them in, let us know. I'm wondering if, if some of those differences that you talked about, about hitting the different types of people, the different types of personalities. I'm wondering if that's more, uh, or is, is it a, a U.S. versus a Canada thing? Is, or is it, you know, just different types of people in different areas uh, of the world? And if, if so, what are some of the other differences that you guys have run into as far as how to, you know, how to, how to explain uh, the benefits of meetings and events um, in those different sectors and in those different areas? I think the U.S. meetings being business, um, they're doing the same thing because a lot of the things and the great practices that they have, we're trying to implement ourselves. Um, so I know they talk, you know, they've been interviewing um, people in the financial uh, sector, for by example. Um, in Canada, one of the key differences between the two of us, between the U.S. and Canada, is that meetings being business Canada has has getting really great financial and um, senior level support from the convention centers across the country. So I virtually have every president and CEO of the major convention centers on my board. Uh, they've all contributed financially. They all see the importance of what we're trying to do because as I said earlier in the program, uh, they want to do expansions. They want to grow. And the only way that they can do that is they need to get the community, their local communities on board and make them understand the economic value in having these um, expansions. So in that regard, we're very lucky. Um, 
We also have support from the airlines. We have support from um, Air Canada um, and uh, WestJet. That's a little different in the U.S. because um, I think there's some um, uh, agreements that there's some, I, I don't really understand enough of it. So Michael, I'll let you share that airline component. So, but for us, they're also, they're also supportive. <laughs> Uh, you know, I, as far as the hierarchy of meetings mean business, somebody a lot smarter than me should probably comment on that. I've been involved in the effort. As a matter of fact, uh, it, this is going back pri prior to uh, uh, meetings mean business. As, as I had the opportunity to speak in Ottawa for National Meetings Industry Day probably 15 years ago. And I was just so impressed with the idea that we were all coming together. Um, that I came back, I was working with MPI at the time and, and said, look, this is something that we could do for the United States. And then we were told, well, that's a great idea, but it'll probably never happen. Well, you know, it, you get attacked, a lot of stuff can happen. The, it, was, it was hopeful there. I don't know if you can recall the feeling that following 9-11, all of us uh, just had of, of uh, coming together you know, mm -hmm. the, the divisiveness of uh, the pol political divisiveness, a lot of that went away for a time. We were talking to each other in the grocery lines. We were doing things like that. And that's the same thing that happened with the, the, the industry, our industry. And then it started to get better. And then it took the second, the next crisis, which was the, the economic crisis, to really get this, on, I think, on the radar. Because, uh, I mean, it, th that was a direct attack on our industry. Okay. So it made it real. I can recall as, as president of, of, of M MPI chapter in Tennessee, uh, Corbin Ball, you know, the, the, our buddy Corbin, the, the tech guru, Corbin was in town. And one of the questions he got from one of our attendees was, Corbin, is, uh, is, is everything going to go now to web conference and, and online and one thing and another? And I, I love his response, and I tell it all the time, and I always give him credit. He said, there's no such thing as a virtual beer, right? And, and I take that a step further. You can't hug somebody's neck, shake their hand, pat them on the back, or kick them in the rear end. Via a, 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 the, these types of things are so helpful as a part of what we do, but you cannot replace uh, uh, 3D, fully engaged, face-to-face -face, uh, with, you know, with anything on, on, on the web. So... That's why we're doing so many hybrid events because they're complementary. These things are necessary and all that. But all of these things are things that we worry about again inside the room where our messaging has to go. And this is one thing that I, I you know, I've, I've spoken now at a couple of the, the global meetings industry day events. Uh, I've advised a couple of local chapters on, on how to proceed on that. And, what I tell them is when you hold an event, don't just, you can always have a cocktail portion. In fact, I would recommend that you always have a cocktail portion. But if you only have a party, you're not, you're not just, you're now celebrating with each other. Right. Invite your local uh, politicians, connect with the media, the local media, because the media is always looking for some interesting story. How can you make that the story, our story, interesting? And Heidi, I, I really like what you said about the fact that these numbers being too big. These are they, so. I don't know that anybody in Nashville cares what the global approach is. All these numbers, they want to know. It, it occurred to me while you were speaking that we have to do a better job of telling those folks who may not be direct stakeholders of our industry what's in it for them. Yeah, that's exactly it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you hit it right on. I. I and, you know, we were, I was in a meeting this morning here in Panama because it looks like Panama is going to license under meetings of being business as well. And they shared some of the struggles they're having. And it speaks to what we talked about earlier. And a lot of it is just not understanding. And how can we get the communities and the government officials to understand what this type of business means and, you know, what it represents to the industry? So um, totally on board there. I know one of the things that I struggle with a little bit, I shouldn't say me, I think our board too does, with this whole Global Meeting Industry Day, which is a great thing. But again, we're talking to ourselves and we need to talk to people other than ourselves. So how can we create a GMID event 
that brings these other stakeholders that may not even realize they're stakeholders? Or how do we get our, you know, one of the things we talked about is high schools. How do we get them engaged and maybe be part of Global Meeting Industry Day? Because at the end of the day, one of their parents probably directly or indirectly works in the industry. And what a great way to start getting those parents more involved because if it's a great event, those kids are going to go home and talk to their parents about it. So we're trying to figure out ways of how can we, and it's got to be, you know, it's going to take time. It's going to take years for us to probably get where we want to be, but we have to start somewhere. And maybe rather than just starting at the top, we need to start at that age where we're, you know, from the educational and education system, but we're, we're, we're still, also, we're, also, we're also in a new era of, of, how people enter the business. I mean, we didn't have master's degrees in event and meeting management, right? You ask anyone of a certain age, I'm a millennial, by the way, uh, <laughs> highlights, they're highlights. You're a wannabe. Which millennium am I? <laughs> Come on, you left yourself wide open for that one. I did, I did. Always look on the bright side. So, <laughs> but, uh, you know, now you have college courses, you have a variety of, 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 of different ways of entering the bit, purposely entering the business. You know, you told your story, you, you didn't purposely enter the business. I didn't purposely, I wouldn't take anything for it. Um, but I do think that there, there's an opportunity to, to define the, the, the stories that we're telling. Um, in a more accessible way to a variety or of, of audiences. When we talk to ourselves, I, don't, I, I, I know that you've been around MPI and PCMA, we are the world's worst about acronyms, speaking in a language that nobody understands but us. Uh, and so when you, when you have a tendency to do that, it's, it's not about dumbing down, it's about telling the fullness of the story, I think. It's about being able to, to, to demonstrate why uh, this is important. I think it's also important for our industry because we want to attract talent. Um, it, it, Nashville, Nashville is just it's exploding. It's not why I left Nashville. I came out here, I came to Arizona with family uh, um, and, and I have no regrets after living most of my life in Nashville. Nashville is so hot like right now, they can't get people to work. All right, so we, we have a, 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 you know, we have a variety of issues. Another issue being affordable housing. I mean, there, there are things that are impacted by what happens in our industry that I think that, that we could take a, a more meaningful role in uh, talking about. I mean, I think that's a good point, especially with Global Meetings Industry Day coming up in April in a couple of weeks. You know, we've talked a lot about the big picture, uh, picture especially Heidi, is the boards grappling with some of these big issues. What's one thing if you wanted to encourage people who are looking to celebrate this to step outside of those conversations we're having with ourselves and maybe make our story broader to get outside the room to use Michael saying, what's the one thing you would hope we do on April 4th? I think one of the things that we're trying to do is what, so for meetings being business in Canada, we do not, we're not executing any of the events, but we did have a, a, a committee. We worked very closely with meetings being business in the US, but we created a toolkit that was customized. And in that toolkit, um, it's information that we've shared now with PCMA, uh, MPI, and some of the other organizations who are producing those events. And part of that is really just asking them the question as well, like, how are we going to change this up for next year and bring people in, more people in from outside? Yeah. We had our prime minister last year acknowledge Global Meeting Industry Day, and we're, we, we think that's going to happen again this year. So that part, you know, is good. That's kind of thinking, you know, outside of, of our industry and that being recognized. But I have to be honest, I think there's still a lot of work that we have to do to make that happen. I'm very comfortable from our perspective. Once we have all these videos done and this communication piece in place, it's going to be a lot easier to kind of make it up and moving forward. So that, that's just my two cents on that. Yeah, I would agree, uh, Heidi. I think uh, this thing has come a long way since taking the Global Meetings Industry Day in particular we're talking about now. It's come a long way in a short period of time, uh, and and it's a great effort, but there's an awfully long way to go 
as far as um, uh, actually getting the word out of the purpose. And as, as I've said to some of them, guys, if you have a cocktail party, that's not going to be of interest to your local media. You know, you have to have something meaningful. It doesn't have to be education necessarily, but I know uh, the Texas Hill Com Country in, uh, in uh, Austin, of course, they're in the capital of the state. Uh, they did a couple years ago an award-winning program for Global Meetings Industry Day, wherein they had a rally on the steps of the state capitol, and they walked uh, across to a place, and and bless her heart, she uh, the person that, that uh, organized that's a friend of mine, uh, Marsha Williams, and Marsha got out early, and she had luminaries from MPI, from MGM Grand, from... Uh, IAEE and, and people that, that come and have a story to tell when they arrive. Um, and it was hugely successful. Now you can't do that everywhere, uh, but if you're going to impact the press, the press is gonna be your mouthpiece to the people, to the majority of the people around you. You know, the, the local business journal, uh, the, the local newspaper, Television's hard to get, but anything that you can get from along those lines. But if you want to attract them, you can't say, hey, we're having a party to celebrate that we're a great industry. You, you've got to have some sort of compelling message to get them out. The, the thing that I tell them is, is that, that I'm not a PR guy, but I can tell you now from being around and owning my own business for a number of years is that a press release is only meaningful if it's got a hook in it. If you, can, if you can hook the press in to come talk about it, you can say, we're doing great things, but you really have to attract them. So I think the one thing I really want, I've already got a takeaway from you that I really like is the level of conversation that we have with people, not overwhelming them with numbers that are not meaningful to them individually. I think that's so smart, so smart. And it, 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 it's going to take all of us to do that. Because the first thing that happened in the U.S. was National Meetings Industry Day. Then M MMB decided to go. Now, see, I've, I've already condemned my colleagues for talking in acronyms, and now I'm doing it as well. So I apologize to everybody. I'll, 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 I'll take acronyms anonymous. I'm, I've got a meeting this afternoon. But, um, but, you know, where we are today, as opposed to when Meetings Mean Business started this in the Global Meetings Industry Day, is so far ahead of where we were with work less left to be done. Um, and, and it's not an easy task, I don't think. I think you have smart people around the, the table. You have, a, you know, it, it's, and let me just say one thing about Global Meetings Industry Day is that the associations, the members of the Events Industry Council, the supporters of Meetings Mean Business in the United States, uh, are big about having their chapters and local areas and participate, all of which is great. There are also a number of companies which have, have taken the banner and done their own events for Meetings Industry Day. And sometimes, depending on the company and how they approach it, they have a, a deeper penetration to the, to the surrounding awareness than, than the chapters do. You guys have touched on it in a couple of different ways, but we did get a question in from the chat asking, how can we encourage the local uh, GMID events to be advocacy events and not just those pat yourselves on the back types of events? So doing the things like you talked about where we're getting folks, uh, you know, up on the uh, state house steps and things like that. How do we encourage the local groups to do that? Well, one of the things that we're going to be talking about after GMID this year, April 4th, we were ready at our recent board meeting said, as soon as these events are over, um, so in our case, Jennifer chairs Global Meeting Industry Day, and so her committee members are the PCMA, MPI, and all those that are organizing the events nationally across the country. So we've said, you know what, as soon as Global Meeting Industry Day is over, we need to do a debrief. Because at that point, when you do the debrief, what worked well, what didn't work well, did we hit the audience that we were after, understanding our strategic plan and our business plan are both the direction we want to go, both from a meetings mean industry perspective as well as from a committee perspective. Now let's talk about what are the things that we can think about doing because it's still fresh in everybody's mind and then create a plan and um, some deliverables for, for the next meeting. So that, that is something that we're looking at doing um, from a Canadian means business perspective. 
Well, and, and I, I think um, if you understand the nature of the beast and that the majority of these are done by uh, uh, partnerships or individually between MPI chapters, PCMA, ASAE, uh, ILEA, the, there I go again with the acronyms, but the industry organizations, let's say. And if you understand the minds uh, and, and, and the, the impetus for someone being uh, a volunteer doing those things, their plates are already full, right? And so they're, they're, one of their main challenges is because those boards by their nature are operational. And they have to tick this off because they got to get back to work. I understand that because that's where I come from, right? I, I get that. And so, so much of the time, and this is what I've said to, to various uh, chairs of, of the uh, MMB here, is that we cannot, we as, as meetings mean business cannot be passive. We have to be active. They take a lesson from why we have meetings mean business, because we, we had a problem. Now we're, we're, we're being, at, but you can't just post something on a website and say, go to the website. Here's what you do. Here's, here's your toolkit. Sometimes you have to, to do a, roll up your sleeves and do a little bit harder work. Uh, and explain. And, and generally, what I have found with chapters, both PCMA and, and MPI, is that they're receptive to doing this. When you, when you sit down and have a serious talk about, uh, about what this is meant to do, that it is a celebration. And we want it to be a celebration. I, I think it's important to celebrate successes in, in that. But that, that the, the overarching uh, purpose is is not for us to celebrate with each other to, to speak to to other people who who um, are affected in ways they don't even know right. so I think that that uh, uh, I just had a conversation just last week with one I said you know you, you've got a great video yeah we posted it yeah but you didn't remind them that you posted it you want them to use it you gotta gotta have to remind them because understand that who you're talking to uh, is a volunteer and volunteers have a lot of stuff to take care of a lot of boxes to tick. So I, I think there is, is some work to be done there. I will say just watching, I'm not involved this year, but watching this year over last year, I think it's gotten, gotten better, but I think that's an area where, uh, we could do better. So if you want to have a good GMID and show that MMB don't necessarily rely on the boards of ILEA, MPI, and PCMA. It's a, it's a BFD. Yeah, it is a BFD. Sorry, I well, in our world, like we don't want to be executing or producing events, but no. we want to be able to just right. give them what they need. That is, to your point, Michael, mm -hmm. that, it, that it's easy enough for them to be able to just take that information and, and for them to do it. And it may, may be is that, and simple is not the right word, but it may be the, uh, shifting emphasis on the from the event to the to the purpose of the event, spending a little bit more time with the folks that are charged with executing, and and telling them that, that here's here's what we're trying to accomplish. Here's here because that there are uh, in the on the U.S. site there's a ton of great resources. There there are templates. There's a template to request for your governor to to sign off on it. There's a variety of things to use. So there are tools. I'm not sure there, so there's content, but not context maybe. Yeah. And I think maybe we could do a better job on, on, on offering the, the, the context. Let me say this, I, I think it's hugely successful. And I think that the, the, the distance that, that the Global Meetings Industry Day in particular has traveled over the time it's been in existence, which is only three, four years now, uh, is incredible. Moving forward, I think that we can do a better job of, of, of providing that context, providing the reason for being and, and, uh, and why the tools are important. Absolutely. Incorporating well, it into a communications plan or to the meetings with business communications plan. And they've got some great templates for that on the, the, each of the respective websites, but also the local chapters of all of our many acronyms. You know, I know those great emails that are being sent out, um, always so many options. But thinking about all the great advice you've shared today, it always almost feels redundant to ask this one, but it's one of our favorite questions because with these years of industry knowledge, we'd be foolish not to. So if you had one tip to share with event planners, what would you share with them given your careers and your experience? Well, I, I tell a story about 
and I use this all the time. There was a famous female comedian, country comedian years ago. I was surprised I used this in a, a keynote I did last month on, and I said, Minnie Pearl. I was surprised by how many people knew who she was. Uh, Minnie Pearl was a highly educated woman who played a uh, backwoods kind of corny country comedian a few years ago. And I tell a story about we had a, a uh, corporate event. It was on the stage of the Ryman Auditorium, the big auditorium in Nashville, the home of the Grand Ole Opry. Uh, Miss Minnie was there. We had singers. We had a variety of things going on for a corporate event. And there was a young woman who had, had just broken out. She had a bad case of stage fright. You could literally see her knees knocking, standing at the side of the stage. And I remember Miss Minnie came over. She is revered in Nashville, by the way. Uh, Miss Minnie come over and she said, honey, what's wrong? She said, I don't know if I can do this. She said, well, let me tell you something Mr. Roy Acuff told me a few years ago. He said, I did the same thing. And he said, she said, Mr. Roy, I don't know if I can do this. And he said, honey, he said, how, how do I get over this sort of feeling? He said, just go on out there and love them and they'll love you back. It's the same thing. This is what I was talking to an association a month. How do we attract new members? Look, this applies across all things. If you care about what you're doing, if you care about your, your, whatever your offering or product is, if you care about the outcomes and you care about the people that you're working with to put it on, and you love them, they'll love you back. How about you, Heidi? Oh, you know, for me, it, it's really about loving what you're doing and being passionate about what you're doing. And when you are passionate about what you're doing, you have to look um, how you're going to continue to grow the industry. Because I think we all have that responsibility, yeah. especially if we want to be mentors and coaches for future generations. So, for doing that, you have to take on a role that is more than just what you do for a living. You have to look at how would you, you know, you're evolving, who helped you evolve, and now it's payback time that you do the same for someone else. And at the same time that you take somewhat of a strategic view to say, what is the evolution of this in industry? What is the next? I mean, when I grew up in the industry, it was when the industry was just, it, it was going in an upward direction. It's kind of flattened a little bit now because it was a new thing and now, you know, it's kind of flattened. So um, how can these new, really, really smart men and women that are coming into our industry take it to a, a whole new uh, level of experience, whether it's immersive, whether it's data versus, it's not, I, I don't know what it is, but I, I that would be my hope um, that, that, they would think a bit more than just what they do every day for a living and how to pay it forward. I love that. That's, we don't get enough good mentors. So that's fabulous. Good one. Mm -hmm. So the last one is what cool resources and tech tools, you know, we've got all these great new people. What are the things you're using resource wise? You've been reading books, blogs, apps, technology platforms. What are you using that we can share with our audience to make their lives easier, better? I just got a fax machine. <laughs> Overhead projector. That's good. I just got asked to fax something. Can I borrow it? <laughs> I, uh, the last time I did, I, someone asked me if I could fax them something. I said, no. They said, why not? I said, because of where I live. I said, they said, where do you live? I said, in the 21st century. Oh. So, <laughs> I wish I'd had that line. Yeah, I'm but, gonna yeah, borrow yeah. that. Um, yeah. You know what, I, you know, meetings being business, the U.S. website, so meetingsbeingbusiness.com, meetingsbeingbusinessCanada, um, they have some great information on that that I think is worthy of sharing. I think a lot of our industry associations have great stuff. Oxford Economics, who really did the global impact for EIC, um, just going on their website and just better understanding um, how, what they're doing in the data from, from a data perspective. But you know what, at the end of the day, it's, I think the best resource for knowledge is talking to people mm -hmm. and interacting and talking. And when you're with friends and when you're networking at events, you know, ask the question and it's amazing the things that you learn, that we learn from each other. So that would be my takeaway. I'd say amen to that, Heidi. I said, I would tell you this as, as a uh, certified talking head, uh, when I attend the conference, I get more out of the person I'm sitting next to than any of the talking heads 
no disrespect, Brant and anybody else who's because I, I love I go for those things, but I live for those moments that, that cannot be captured anywhere else. There is a place and you know, there's, there's this big discussion about where associations are going, where membership organizations are going, because so much of the information is available online. And, you know, you go back to Corbin's uh, comment about the, the, the virtual beer, et cetera. But the richness of gatherings and the connections that you make, the meaningful connections that transcend business. Um, a friend of mine, I don't know if you know Karen Massacott. Karen's a dear friend of mine from out in Vancouver. Karen said to me one day, she said, you know, I have my friends I've met through MPI. Uh, I have my friends, I'm, excuse me, let me say it this way. I have my MPI friends, but then I have my friends I met through MPI. And there's business to be done there, right? There is, there's learning to be done there. The, 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 the power of community and, and human connections it is an incredible force. And while we do need to adjust uh, and deal with us millennials, um, they, they, what we, we also, it, that, that's a, a powerful story to tell, it, it is, is what comes out of it. And I, I know that, uh, that peer learning and, and connecting, I mean, that, that's what the real richness, I think, of the industry is. That's why people keep coming back. That's why I suggest to people, if you're going to join, okay, our, our MO for years, coming from the music side of it, was we would join an organization, get our name in the directory, and wait for the phone to ring. Doesn't work. What else doesn't work is handing out business cards like they're a deck of cards. There's, there's no more valuable business card than the one that somebody asks you for. The, the, the value in doing these things and, and being involved in a community of, of like-minded professionals is is that human connection is the ability to to talk and learn what somebody's made of in a situation where you can't lose there's no threats involved and you learn that 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 they're sincere and that they care uh then you know i meet somebody like that i may not need them now but i'm going to call on those people i want people that i've already built trust with before i have to do business with them. Well, Mr. Owen, that's going to have to be the last word. I want to thank you so much for joining us. Tell, tell folks out there where they can find out more about you and what you're up to these days. Well, I got a couple of sites. I got our, our company site, which is eventgenuity.com, www.eventgenuity.com. Uh, and I'm now doing speaking and facilitating as uh, my avocation, and that's michaelowen.info. Nice, nice. Well, thank you so much for joining us. We really appreciate your insights on this. And Heidi Welker, where can people find out more about you and what you're up to? Well, I am with Freeman Audiovisual Canada, so you can reach me at Heidi.Welker at Freeman.com or our website. Um, or you can also go into, I chair Meetings Mean Business Canada, so go into our Meetings Mean Business Canada site, website, and you can learn lots about me and a lot of the other great people that are um, major, major, major contributors to the success of um, creating a business event story that will mean be quite meaningful. Very nice. Well, thank you so much for joining us. We really appreciate it. Great. All right. And co-host Lindsay Martin Bilbury, thank you so much for joining me today. We realized I realized we didn't really do an intro with you today to say who you were, you know. We don't need that. I mean, Brand, it's just you. We're glad to have you here too, Brant. You always bring a charm and a happiness one can't live without. Don't you think, Michael? Don't you think, Heidi? <laughs> well, where can folks find out more about what you're up to? Oh, you know, we're out there on the Twitter and on the Instagram. Look for Lindsay the CMP or check us out over at pathable.com for the latest webinar for your CEU credit. And I'm Brant Kruger, BrantKruger.com. I'm all over the place as Brant Kruger as well. We want to tell you all, thanks so much for joining us here Absolutely. on Event Icons. Oh, thanks to our guests. Thanks to everybody that was joining us in the chat. There was a lot of back and forth in there about what's going on in the world. Um, some great questions came in there as well. Uh, we want to remind you all that Event Icons is recorded live 
every Wednesday, each and every Wednesday. I think at this point, it is the longest running weekly industry podcast uh, that's out there. Um, every Wednesday, 5 p.m. Eastern at event-icons.com. Uh, it's available the following Tuesday uh, on the uh, Endless blog and then shortly thereafter on all of your favorite podcasting apps, whether that's Pocket Cast, Stitcher, iTunes, wherever you want to get your podcast, that's where we want to be. So let us know if there's a platform that we're not on. Uh, but the best place to watch is event-icons.com. That way you can watch us live. You can join in the chat. You can throw questions. You can throw curveballs. You can talk about the weather, whatever you want to do in there. There you can see the show notes. You can see the links to all of the fantastic resources that we shared throughout the show. And again, you can join the chat and it's just like you can sit here and interview our event icons you don't need us you we like that help us out so we want to know what you think tell us who you want to see who are the icons of the event industry who do you want to see on the show reach out at hashtag event icons on twitter or you can reach us uh there on the web page as well let us know who you want to see on the show thank you so much for joining us and we'll see you next time on event icons Thank you for joining us for another amazing episode of Hashtag Event Icons. To catch the transcription and all of the resources mentioned, head to www.helloendless.com slash blog. This week's episode will be posted and available by next Tuesday. Also, let us know what you thought about this week's episode. Share your biggest takeaway and join the social conversation sponsored by Little Bird Told Media. Just tag your post with Hashtag Event Icons. We'd love to hear from you. Thank you again for joining us. We'll see you next Wednesday at 5 p.m. Eastern right here on Hashtag Event Icons.